as I did last night. And welcome, by the way. Good evening to everybody. Glad to see you. So glad to see you. Uh, as I did last night, I'm just going to very briefly say a few things, introduce them, because the, what we want to get to is the, is the teaching tonight. That's what's important. But I am thankful you're here, and this is the second installment uh, of the sequence of pre-tribulational events, which I do believe is right now where we're living, certainly very, very pertinent to what's going on and how wonderful it is to have God's word. Otherwise, we nobody would have a clue, and most of the world in darkness has no clue. We're honored to have Dr. Fruchenbaum with us, and I just remind you that tomorrow at 9.30, the rise and fall of Antichrist, another very significant subject. And then at the worship service, woohoo, the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church, so how wonderful uh, what topics are. And uh, for those that are watching live stream, I would remind you that tomorrow at both services there is a nursery. There is a nursery tomorrow. So um, and I want to encourage you again that after the service tonight, if you haven't done so, to go by the resource table. Back there in the fellowship area, there's just a all kinds of literature. Some of it's even free, and it's all wonderful literature um, that, that every one of us need. And uh, I would mention giving to Aerial Ministries. Anything that is placed in the box back there tonight will go as a love gift to Aerial Ministries, and we encourage you to support them. Uh, yeah, it's a very worthy thing for God's people to support. The close of the worship service tomorrow, we will be uh, taking a love offering for Ariel and Dr. Fruchenbaum as well, so please keep that in mind. And uh, at the close of each of these sessions, the doctor has agreed to answer a few questions. So um, uh, kind of keep your, if you have a question in, in mind, kind of keep that. And at the end, you'll have an opportunity. All right, let me... Uh, briefly pray and ask God to bless us and be with us tonight, and then we'll get to our teaching. Father, we know that each meeting and each opportunity for us to hear your precious word is ordained in our lives even by you. Bring to us through your servant the things we need, Father, tonight. And Lord, our hope is in Christ Jesus. And we know the, the plans of, of man and the ideas of man outside of you are darkness altogether, and they will fail. But because of your word, Father, we have the truth that guides our way, that is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path. And I pray, Father, you'd be with us and help us to learn from your precious word Bless Dr. Fruchtenbaum as he teaches. Help him, Father, and speak through him. And use him again mightily uh, to help others know Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for his presence with us and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. When I think of Dr. Fruchtenbaum, I think of 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He brings a scholarly exegesis of God's word that we so much need. And not only that, he brings it with a, a background, a Jewish and scholarly background, a learned background that is so helpful to us. So we're privileged, of course, to be instructed by you, doctor, and would you please come now and teach us. Hopefully everybody here has an outline to continue what we began last night. We're dealing with nine specific events that will lead up to the tribulation. 
Three of these events uh, have already happened, World War I and II, and decisive um, effect it had on Israel's history, Jewish history. Then secondly, the establishment of Israel as a state in 1948. And the third key event already fulfilled is that is East Jerusalem, which is the biblical Jerusalem, fell under Israeli sovereignty in the Six-Day War back in 1967. The other six events are still future, and the one we already covered is the Gog and Magog invasion of Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 1 through chapter 30, uh, chapter 38, verse 1 through chapter 39, verse 16. Now, following the outline, let's turn to Daniel chapter 7. The theme of the whole book of Daniel is the times of the Gentiles, and he prophesies a development of foreign Gentile empires. Babylon was the first. Medo-Persia was the second. The third underwent two stages, the United States under Alexander the Great, and then the, um, and then the fourth division stage when he died, his four generals divided the empire among themselves. Now, what Daniel focuses most of his um, concept, uh, concept is on the fourth empire, which he does never names. But undergoes five specific stages. The first stage is the United States, which was the period of the Roman Empire. And then came the two division stage in the fourth century between the Eastern Roman Empire and based in Constantinople and the Western Roman Empire still based in the city of Rome. And the, so the first two stages have already been fulfilled, and the second stage is still ongoing. But there are three more stages to go. So let's look at chapter 7 of Daniel and verse 23. Daniel 7, verse 23. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And, he, and notice that he emphasizes that ultimately the fourth empire in the third stage of its future history will take over the whole world. The way some people try to get around this is that the Rome conquered the then known world, but that wasn't true. For example, the Alexander, the previous empire, went as far east as uh, India, and Rome never went that far east. Furthermore, Emperor Hadrian had to build what's called the Hadrian's Wall, what is now Scotland, to keep the proto-Scots from attacking Roman troops. So it's obvious that once you conquer up to a certain point, you can see this more out there. So Rome never conquered the then known world, let alone the whole known world. But we take the text as it reads, using the same terminology as Genesis in the Noahic Flood, and some people do teach Noah's flood was um, a local flood, but biblically cannot be for, uh, defended that way because the Noah's uh, warum went around the whole world, and this passage should be understood the same way. There's going to be a one-world one government developing eventually. Now, since uh, the division into two, we've always had this east-west balance of power. And with the Russian um, emphasis being destroyed in the Gog and Magog war, that essentially destroys the eastern balance of power, and that will help to develop this third stage of the um, fourth Gentile empire. And the fourth stage is a one world government of some kind. We're not told a lot about the details, but it's gonna be a one world government of some kind. And it will arise before the tribulation starts, but also break up before the tribulation starts. So skipping down now to verse 24, as for the ten horns out of this kingdom, which kingdom? The kingdom that has now conquered the whole world. Out of this kingdom shall ten kings arise. So eventually there'll be a ten-stage division. Today we have almost 200 nations around the world. Not quite that many, but getting close to that. But Eventually, there will only be 10 Gentile nations plus Israel. And so the 10 division states will both arise, but eventually also 
uh, cont uh, also eventually continue until the midpoint of the tribulation, but it will arise before the um, before the tribulation starts. And the 10th division stage will start before the tribulation and continue until the midpoint of the tribulation. Verse 24 then goes on, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the former, he shall put down three kings. Eventually, this uh, little horn, which was the Antichrist horn, he will declare war against all ten kings in the middle of the conflict. He will kill three of them, and then yet the seven will submit to his authority. Now tomorrow, we'll start this tonight, but also the mostly in the first hour tomorrow on the rise and fall of the Antichrist. So we'll pick this theme up again at that point. We look at your um, events. Following the one world government, then we have the next stage, the ten kingdom division. And the king, ten kingdom division will begin before the tribulation and continue right to the middle of the tribulation. What's also seen in verse 24, it's after the 10 stage division that we're going to see the rise of the Antichrist. It's often been um, a pattern in what the sensational type prophetic teaching that every time we have a new president, he's somehow going to fulfill the position of the Antichrist. I don't know why the American president has to be the Antichrist. And so I have uh, several books in my library where different people have been identified as the Antichrist, including uh, Hitler, including Mussolini, including some others in the presidency. But until we have a 10 division stage, the Antichrist cannot rise, but will begin to rise at the time that the, um, sometime before the tribulation starts. He won't gain full power until the midpoint, as we'll see tomorrow. But he will rise to power right at the point when, uh, before the tribulation starts. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 Thess chapter 5. In chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, he describes the rapture event. That's a topic we'll cover tomorrow. But in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, he changes the topic. And he starts out with those two English words, but concerning, which is a translation of two Greek words, peri, P-E-R-I, de, de. Peri, P-E-R-I, de, de. And whenever those two words are used, it introduces a brand new topic. He frequently uses uh, those two words in the book of 1 Corinthians. As you read the 1 Corinthians, you notice every time there's a new topic, the English reads, but concerning, but concerning, in Greek, that's peridere. And peridere always introduces a new topic, so whatever he discussed previous, those two words are finished with, and now a new topic, therefore peridere. And the new topic... He reveals, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that ought be written unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And when they are saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon the woman with child, and they shall in no wise escape. The new topic, notice, is the day of the Lord. And again, that's the most common phrase in both testaments of what we now call the tribulation. See, so he starts a brand new topic, the tribulation. And he points out they already know the details because this is part of what he taught them when he was still with them in Thessalonica. 
And what he points out the, about the events that will um, be part of the nine events that lead up to the tribulation <laughs> is the period of peace and false security in verses 1, 2, and 3. So verse 3, when they are saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall in no wise escape. So just before the tribulation actually starts, which starts with the seven-year covenant, the um, emphasis here then is they'll be, they'll be feeling a peace of safety. They feel that the wars are now over, and suddenly the destruction of the day of the Lord will hit. Because the last event on the list notice is going to be the event that actually triggers the tribulation. I'll we'll cover that in just a minute. The rest of the chapter 5 we'll deal with tomorrow in dealing with the timing of the rapture. But for now, the main thing to notice from our topic at the moment is that the period of peace and safety is going to be on this earth and suddenly the destruction comes of the day of the Lord. Okay, let's go to, this, to the event that actually triggers the tribulation, and let's go back to Daniel, but this time chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, we have Daniel's famous prophecy of the 70 sevenths, or the 490 year period God has decreed upon the Jewish people. It goes beyond our purpose for the topic we're covering to go to this whole passage phrase by phrase. But if you do this on your own or have done it, what you notice is that by the time you come to the end of verse 26, the first 483 years of this 490 period has already been fulfilled historically, ending at the time of the first coming of the Messiah. For still seven years left to run of this prophetic time clock of Israel, the same seven years as those of the tribulation. And the question now is, what will be the singular event that will finally actually trigger the tribulation and the seven years then begin. Now look in verse 27, and he shall make a firm covenant with many for one seven. The pronoun he goes back to its nearest antecedent, that's found in verse 26 as the prince that shall come. In other words, the prince that shall come in verse 26, and the he who makes a covenant in verse 27 is the one and the same individual better known in our circles as simply the Antichrist. And so the actual seven years begin, not with the rapture of the church, the rapture will simply precede the tribulation by some unknown amount of time. But the specific events that triggers the tribulation is the signing of this covenant, a covenant made to continue for the seven years length of time. Now this presupposes two things. First of all, he presupposes that there is a Jewish state with a Jewish government with whom a covenant like this could be signed, and that has been true only as of 1948 when this became a state. And so the first prerequisite to fulfill verse 27 is in place. There is a Jewish state and a Jewish government in the Middle East. But the second thing this piece poses is that the Antichrist would be of high political authority in order to be able to sign a covenant of this nature because sovereign states like Israel do not sign covenants with nobodies. And so on sometime, as we saw in the previous um, eighth stage on this list, during the period of rise of period of peace and security, just before that, there's the rise of the Antichrist. He continues to rise with capital H and finally has enough strength, enough authority, enough recognition in world to sign a seven-year covenant with the people of Israel. 
It is often referred to as a peace covenant in modern times, but not a peace covenant. We'll see that in the next passage momentarily. Because uh, this is not a covenant that guarantees Israel peace. It simply guarantees Israel's security. Now notice three things else in this verse. He shall make a covenant with many for one week. First of all, the covenant is made with many, and the many would have to include the Jewish leadership of Israel in power to sign a covenant of this nature, but it will not be made with all. Secondly, in the middle of the seven, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. The second event will happen in the middle of the seven years, where he will cause a fourth cessation of the practices in the Jewish temple. As we mentioned last night, the Jewish temple will need to be rebuilt sometime either before the tribulation starts or in the first half of the tribulation. So by the time we come into the middle, the temple is functioning and standing. But now, in the middle of the week, he will bring about a fourth cessation of the sacrificial system. And the third key event, and upon the wing of abomination shall come one that makes desolate, and even to the full end, and that determined shall wrath be put out upon the desolate. The, sec the third element is that once he breaks the covenant, once he takes over the Jewish temple to proclaim himself to be God Almighty, he will then begin a policy to try to annihilate the Jewish people once and for all. And that, uh, the program of annihilating the Jews will begin at the midpoint of the tribulation. It is signaled by the abomination of desolation. And that is why in Matthew 24, verses 15 to 22, Matthew 24, 15 to 22, and the Jewish people uh, uh, see this event taking place, the Messiah told them, flee. Flee the city, flee the country. Because that signals the first, the, the final attempt to annihilate the Jews once and for all, be a Nazi-like program won't be limited to Europe as it was under Nazi Germany, it'll be in a worldwide scale to try to annihilate every Jew living anywhere around the world. Now let's turn to a parallel passage. It's not on your outline, but it's in Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Let's begin with verse 14, Isaiah 28, verse 14. Wherefore hear the word of Jehovah, ye scoffers that rule this people that is in Jerusalem. And this gives us the God's perspective on the rulers who are making this covenant. They think it will give them a measure of security, as we'll see in a minute. But they believe they're going to be receiving security. And again, it's a security covenant, but not a peace covenant. And he calls them scoffers, or he calls them fools for believing in this covenant. And that's because of God's, relation, God's uh, evaluation of the covenant itself in verse 15. Because ye have said, the Jewish leaders, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with she all are we in agreement. And when the overflowing skirt shall pass through, it shall not come unto us, for made lies our refuge, and the falsehood have we hidden ourselves. Here we see why the Jewish leaders will someday feel the need of signing such a covenant. Because they feel they finally get military security as a result of this covenant. And start putting the trust in the God of Israel for their security, they put their trust in this covenant. 
because as your fools for thinking so, this is not a covenant of heaven, but of hell, not a covenant of life, but of death. Now, the reason they bothered to make this covenant is, is to avoid the overflowing scourge or the overflowing flood. And whenever the figure of a flood is used symbolically, if it's used literally, it just means a flood, but if it's used symbolically, it's always a symbol of a military invasion. And what they believe is that by making this covenant, they will no longer be subject to any further military problems. And so they believe then that there won't be any more overflowing scourge that's going to come to us. And the reason is we've made lies our refuge under falsehood have we hidden ourselves. So again, it is this signing of the covenant that will trigger that seven-year tribulation period. The same three things we mentioned in Daniel 9.27 also happen in this context. First of all, the covenant is made with the leadership and is made with the majority, but not with all. And verse 16 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone of sure foundation. He that believes shall not be in haste. Now, whenever the word stone is used symbolically, it's always a symbol of the Messiah. So he's referring to a group of Jewish people living at that time who became believers sometimes, sometime after the rapture, and they know about this covenant, and they know the real purpose of the covenant, and they will not go along with the policy of the covenant. And he, he, he that believes shall not be in haste, and these are Jewish believers in the Messiah living in that time, and they will not go along with this treaty, because they put their faith in the stone, in the messianic stone. In the New Testament, this phrase is often quoted in reference to the Messiah. The second element is that eventually the covenant is broken. It won't last the full seven years it was uh, entitled to. So in verse 17, I'll make justice the line and righteousness the plummet, and the hills shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. And your covenant with that shall be annulled. Your agreement with shall will not stand. And when the overflowing skirt shall pass through, then you shall be trotted down by it. As in Daniel 9.27, so here in verse 17, and 18, the covenant will not last seven years. It will be broken. And in Daniel's prophecy, right in the middle of that seven-year period, it will be broken. And now in place of rece receiving military security, now it becomes subject to further military problems. As he continues on this third facet, now Israel begin to suffer. Verse 19, as often, this is the, the sweeping scourge, the military immense. As often as it passes through, it shall take you from morning by morning. It shall pass through by day and by night. It shall be nothing but terror to understand the message. For the bed is shorter and the man can stretch himself out on it, and the cover narrower than he can wrap himself in it. What he points out in these verses, the place of being finding the security, they're now subject to inv invasive attack one day after another, by, by day and by night. And they'll suffer terror instead of suffering, um, instead of achieving the security, they can be suffering terror because with the abomination of desolation, then uh, Satan using the Antichrist will inaugurate the last attempt to annihilate the Jews once and for all. And in place of receiving the comforture of signing that covenant, he points out a strong measure of discomfiture. He provides two examples in verse 20. First of all, like trying to stretch yourself out on the bed but the bed is too short for you. 
Or secondly, try and wrap yourself up in a blanket, but the blanket is too small to cover all of you. Being a five foot four inch Jewish kid, I've never had this first experience. Every bed, every bed I've tried to stretch myself out on it, I've succeeded admirably. There's some problems you don't have when you're only five foot four. Every two years or so, I've been leading the special five week long study tours of Israel. One of the participants back in 1978 was a professional basketball player with the San Antonio Spurs. He was just under seven feet tall. The only Philistine who ever was attending one of my trips to Israel. <laughs> and, um, and because beds in Israel are made for more my size people, at breakfast time he complained to me about a very uncomfortable night and had to sleep on the floor to stretch himself out. I had no way of identifying myself with his trials and tribulations. There's some problems you don't have when you're five foot four. I have had the second experience. I was a student at the Hebrew University, and in the, um, in the uh, we had some um, explore, exploration to because I was uh, studying in historical geography at the land of Israel. The month of January, we had uh, cl uh, off classes from the university, and we spent about three weeks uh, in travels in the different parts of Israel in that day. And, um, be and because the old border with Jordan cut, cut into the heartland of Israel, for that reason, when we spent the when we had to stay close to the border, we would spend the night in the military encampment. And the blanket I was issued the first night was even too small for a five foot, um, five, I should say four foot, whatever my height is, five foot four, two inches, or four inches, five foot four. The blanket I was issued was even too small to cover all of me. And that night, as I tried to keep my nose warm, my feet would get cold. <laughs> when I tried to warm my feet up, my nose got cold. And the whole night, the story kept repeating itself. I would fall asleep, wake up, fall asleep, wake up, because that stupid blanket wouldn't cover all of me. So it was a night for insecurity, a night of discomfort. Then picking up where we left off in verse 20, uh, 21, for Jehovah will rise up in, in Mount Perazim, and he will be wrought as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and to bring to pass his act, his strange act. The Bible has many different names for the tribulation. Here are two such names, Jehovah's strange work and Jehovah's strange act. And it's a strange work and a strange act because of the last passage in verse 22. Now, therefore, be not scoffers, lest your bonds be made strong, for a decree of destruction have I heard from the Lord, Jehovah of hosts, upon the whole earth. Because with the signing of this covenant, God issues a decree of destruction that will affect the whole world in general. And this decree of destruction is the same as the seven sealed scroll in Revelation chapter 6. And as each scroll is broken, there is a massive destruction of the earth's surface, a massive destruction of the earth's population. So by the time the seven years have run their course, about two thirds up to three quarters of the earth's surface is destroyed, an equal percentage of the earth's population. But what causes the God to issue this decree of destruction is in the last, is because of the signing of the covenant and issues this decree of destruction have I heard from the Lord, Jehovah hosts upon the whole earth. And this will be the specific event to actually trigger the tribulation. Now, there are also a couple of other events that are set to happen before the tribulation, but we're not given enough information to know where to fit them in. So in these nine stages, we can follow the sequence, but then there's going to be three other events that uh, cannot be followed. For the first one, let's turn to the minor prophet Joel, Hosea, Joel, second minor prophet, and look at chapter two. Okay. 
Okay, Joel 2, verse 31, Joel chapter 2, verse 31, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of Jehovah come. Thus again, the phrase, the terrible day of Jehovah, and uh, that is a, a term for the tribulation, the most common term in both testaments. But he points out before that covenant, uh, before that the terrible day of Jehovah comes, there will be a, uh, a, a total blackness, a blackout of the sun, moon, and stars, similar to the blackout in Egypt among the ten plagues. There are five different blackouts recorded in Bible prophecy. One will occur before the tribulation, that's the point here. The second, third, and fourth will happen during the tribulation, and the fifth one will happen right after the tribulation, detailed in Matthew uh, 24, verses 29 through 31. Matthew 24, verses 30, 29 to 31. But there will be a total blacking out for a period of time of all light from the sun, moon, and stars sometime before the tribulation starts. We're not given enough information here to know when that will happen, but we simply know it's going to happen at some point of time. And now let's go to another passage, Malachi. Some people think he was an Italian prophet. They call him Malachi. It's not Malachi. In Hebrew, it's Malachi, and in English, Malachi. And look at chapter 4, verse 5. Chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of Jehovah come. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And another thing that will happen before the tribulation actually starts is the return of Elijah the prophet. And he will, what he will have is a special ministry to the Jewish community to overcome a key stumbling block. And the key stumbling block is that this Jesus could be the Messiah. And so he will have a message to the people of Israel to get them to finally re-educate them. And finally they'll come to realize who the Messiah was and will be. And that is Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah of Israel. But again, we don't have enough information to know how to fit them in the sequence of events. However, it will happen at some point. And one more event that we'll cover in detail tomorrow morning, that'll be the rapture of the church. Now, uh, what we're going to do is start another study. You should, um, we should get you the outline on the rise and fall of the Antichrist. Is Lee here around? The rise and fall of the Antichrist outline, do you have it? But starting this tonight, we'll be able to finish both topics in the two sessions we'll have tomorrow. What the Antichrist will try to become is a uh, copy of the true Messiah. The true Messiah has a multiplicity of names found in both Testaments. And each of his names says something about Messiah's person and something about Messiah's work. The same thing will be true with the counter-Messiah, the Antichrist. And altogether, he has 11 different names given to him in the cross of scriptures. The first six names I'll give you is from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. 
And uh, first name is the seed of Satan in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the seed of Satan. And Genesis 3, 15 is not only the first prophecy of the true Messiah, the seed of the woman. It's also the first prophecy of the anti-Messiah, the Antichrist. And he's the seed of Satan. All the other names we have for him in the Hebrew Bible are from the book of Daniel. The second name is the little horn. The little horn in Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. Daniel 7, verse 8. The third name is the king of fierce countenance. The king of fierce countenance in Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. Daniel chapter 8, verse 23. The fourth name in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, Daniel 9, 26, is the prince that shall come, the prince that shall come. His fifth name is the desolator in Daniel 9, 27, the desolator. And the sixth name is the willful king, the willful king in Daniel 11, verse 36, 11, 36. The remaining five names are all in the New Testament, and three of these names come from only all come from one chapter in Paul's writings, Second Thessalonians chapter two, Second Thess chapter two. He's called the man of sin in chapter two, verse three, the man of sin. He's also called the son of perdition, the son of perdition. Also in 2 Thess chapter 2, verse 3. And one more name from the same chapter, the lawless one. The lawless one in chapter 2, verse 8. Two more names. The most common name we use today is the name Antichrist. It only appears uh, one time, and that's in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, 1 John 2, 22. So it's not a common name for him in Scripture, but it is a common, uh, is a name that is mentioned. And the last one, which is far more common, is the beast. The beast. One example of several is Revelation 11, verse 7. Revelation 11, verse 7. So the basic meaning on the capital C of your outline, the true son has a multiplicity of names, and by the same token, the counterfeit son also has a multiplicity of names. And every name says something about his nature or character or some and or something about his work or purpose. Okay, let's move on to the next segment, the origin of the Antichrist. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Chapter 3 records the fall of humanity to sin. And therefore you have in this chapter, the first chapter, the first prophecy about the coming of the Messiah to deal with Satan. But it's often missed as also the first prophecy of the Antichrist. So let's look at verse uh, 15 of chapter 3. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. What he points out here is this conflict of Satan against womanhood and womankind. But also emphasizes just as the true Messiah will have a supernatural origin insofar as humanity is concerned. He was always God, but he became man by a supernatural act by God. But at the same token, 
the Antichrist will also have a supernatural origin. Let's talk with, let's discuss first of all the seed of Dumim. That contradicts the normal pattern because the seed is always traced through the male line, not the female line. But for some reason, not revealed here, revealed later. In the case of the uh, mother of the Messiah, he'll be over after the seed of doom and not the seed of the man. And the reason, as we know later, is because of the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Isaiah 7, 14, the Messiah will be conceived and born of a virgin. So in the case of the Messiah, you have no choice. You have to reckon his line after the seed of Doman, because there's no male line to trace him with. When you see the same word used twice in the same verse, it should be understood in the same way, unless there's a clear indication that it cannot be understood in the same way. So not only there is the seed of Doman, you also have the seed of the serpent, the seed of Satan. And so what this indicates, there'll be a supernatural origin of the Antichrist, who'll be impregnated, a human woman, with the seed of Satan. Now something like this has already happened, not on the satanic level, but on the demonic level, in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, where many of the um, angels that fell with Satan, who became demons, Whenever angels appear, they, off, they often appear, in fact, they always appear as young men, never as old men, never as women, but always as young men, and we're often mistaken for young men. And so what this shows is that Satan will be supernaturally conceived. It will be a counterfeit virgin birth supernaturally conceived by the power of Satan. According to Daniel chapter 9, verses 26 and 27, which we already looked at, he will be the final world ruler of the times of the Gentiles. He'll be the final, he'll be the fifth stage and the final world ruler of the times of the Gentiles. So Genesis 6, you had fallen angels taking on human form and intermarrying with human women. And the result was the evilness that fell upon the world that required the worldwide flood to cleanse the earth. So just as the true Messiah had both a natural origin, he was born of a woman, had a supernatural origin because the, 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 the uh, conception was supernatural. By the same token, Satan will have a superhuman origin. His father will be Satan. Now as to his human origin, turn to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Look at verse 37. I'm reading from the ASV, the 1901 edition. And verse 37 says, Neither shall he regard the gods, that's plural, of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, who shall magnify himself above all. Now, if you have the King James Version, it reads with a literally capital G-O-D. But in the Hebrew text, 
He delineates carefully using the singular word for God and the plural form for God. And when it says the, uh, in the King James Version, he shall not regard, he will regard the God of his fathers, actually that's the simple plural form. He will not regard the gods of his fathers. This is important to note because people, some people teach the Antichrist has to be Jewish. But he's never identified as a Jew. He's identified as being a Roman origin, the last Roman ruler of the four Gentile empire. Most other translations have made that correction. I think the New King James did not make that correction, but the others have made that correction. So what he's referring to is that the Antichrist will be worshiping the gods of, he will not worship the gods of his ancestors. He'll worship someone else, Satan. We will not regard, he will not worship the pagan gods of his ancestors. So as we shall see even more clearly tomorrow in a study on the Antichrist, he will be a Gentile or Roman origin. He'll be, he's going to be the last Roman ruler of the final form of the Fourth Empire. He'll be a Gentile of Roman origin. Others bring up another issue. They claim, well, in chapter 7 of Revelation, there's a tribe missing, the tribe of Dan. And therefore, the Antichrist will be from the tribe of Dan. And therefore, the Antichrist will be a Jew. Now, if you look at, if you look at Revelation 7, he lists specifically 12 names. And he does eliminate the tribe of Dan. But he doesn't spell out why Dan is missing. <coughs> And because Revelation built so much on the content of the Hebrew Bible, especially the prophecies in the Hebrew Bible, Revelation put some many of those prophecies in a chronological sequence. So it's always important to see if we have tribes missing in previous passages, and we do. For example, in um, in the Deuteronomy, chap Deuteronomy chapter thirty-three. It lists the set the um, tribal blessings that Moses gives, but to maintain the symmetry of twelve, he has to drop a name, and he drops Simeon. Because if you list all of the tribal names, it's not twelve names; it's thirteen names. Because Joseph received two sons that started their own tribe, so these are two half tribes: Ephraim and Manasseh. To get to make up the tribe of Joseph, so sometimes. The text might say Ephraim, other times it might say Joseph. And in this list, he mentions uh, Joseph in verse 8, so the other one would be um, the, the tribe of Ephraim. In order to maintain the symmetry of 12, Moses left out uh, that one tribe, Simeon. And then if you look at Revel uh, if you study the two chapters in Ezekiel chapters 47 and 48, we list how the 12 tribes are going to be settled in the Messianic kingdom, and he doesn't mention Levi. Levi is mentioned in a different context altogether, but he mentions 12 names, and guess what's missing? The tribe of Levi. And so the purpose of um, listing the 12 names, the skipping a name, is to maintain the symmetry of 12. So for the same reason that Moses left out a tribe and Ezekiel left out a tribe, that's the reason John leaves out the tribe. And that's just to maintain the symmetry of 12. Going back to Old Testament history solves the problem. So it's really that simple. It's not because Dan disappears, because Dan is given tribal territory in Ezekiel 47 and 48. So the only reason, based upon the Old Testament, that Dan is missing is to maintain the symmetry of 12. There's not any implication that the Christ would come from the tribe of Dan. That was just an assumption some people made, but it's not indicated anywhere in this passage. 
so as to his natural origin, he's going to be a descendant of a Roman woman that is impregnated by Satan. And what happened in Genesis 6 will happen again, but this one Satan himself will do so. As to his human origin, he'll be born of a woman of Roman origin, born of a woman of Roman origin. So what you have here is a counterfeit virgin birth, and you have the concept of a counterfeit God-man. And as far as Roman numeral three, as far as we'll go, because we already covered this uh, in our study today, the Antichrist and the start of the tribulation and, the, and Daniel 9.27, it is caused by the signing of the seven-year covenant. And the tribulation starts in Revelation chapter six, verse one and two, as the seals begin to be broken by the Messiah himself. Okay, we'll pick it up with this. Um, outline with the first hour and then move into the um, second hour with the Antichrist. Before we go into questions, yesterday I showed you the prophecy book called The First Test of the Messiah, which covers all of the prophecies in both testaments in um, a way that gives us the sequence of prophetic events. Correlated with that is this book that came out uh, about three years ago, The Feasts and Fasts of Israel. It deals for all of the seven holy seasons, so Leviticus 23. Shows how the first four feasts have been fulfilled by the first coming, but the last three festivals are yet to be fulfilled by the rapture and then the second coming and the kingdom. And uh, this covers all of these festivals, and we begin with the different uh, uh, passages where they are listed. Secondly, the different names the sum, that they appear. Then thirdly, we deal with the um, biblical rules and practices. Then fourthly, with the rabbinic editions, of which there are many. And then fifthly, the messianic implications, messianic fulfillment of each of these. So this is available at the back table. I mentioned pamphlets. This is just one of them. Like, does God have a son? This is one of the objections of Jewish people against the Messiah. And there are the other topics, like how is it possible to be born of a virgin and things of that nature. And these are the kind of pamphlets you can simply pick up and give to any Jewish context that you might, you might have. It's a good tool for evangelism. I did mention yesterday our online school. We also have a summer school program in uh, upstate New York in the other Rondex. It's called the um, Shoshana, the School of Messianic and Jewish Studies. It's an eight-week program. So we start with a two-week curriculum, then a three-week curriculum, then a one-week, which is the one we teach every year, the Life of the Messiah from a Jewish perspective, then a two-week curriculum, and then we have the Labor Day weekend. All the other courses are on a five-year cycle, so to get everything um, you need to want to know, need to um, come for five summers. But the one course we teach every year is the Life of Messiah course, and that's in the sixth week. The other teachers that co-teach with me, but in that one week course, I'll be the only teacher, because we're gonna cover all of it in that one week. And uh, you find these sheets on the table, and it gives you all of the details, what is being taught by whom and by what, and so on. And I live here in San Antonio, and I can testify in the months of July and August, it's a great time to leave this hot house and come up and enjoy the cool mountains of the Adirondacks in upstate New York, only 40 miles south of the border with Canada. And so you're welcome to come as long as you have the freedom to come. You can come for a one-week course, a two-week course, a three-week course, and the details are gonna be right in here. And as far as um, pamphlets, this is gonna deal with the rise and fall of the Antichrist. We have those on the table and also the rapture of the church, which will be the two things we'll be finalizing in our study tomorrow. One more thing which is important to us. What we do is we publish an Ariel magazine prayer guide. And uh, the many, uh, there are people in almost every church that are prayer warriors, especially in the mission field and so on. So what we do with this magazine, for example, 
we cover like our branch in India and all other branches within the U.S. and also around the world. And um, on one side, we have the prayer requests already answered. And uh, also on the other side, there are new prayer requests. This one is on Italy, for example. So if you're a prayer warrior and like to pray for our staff, and as I go through my quiet time, I don't pray the whole book each day, but I pray uh, one section, then the next section, the next section, and so on. And it, by the time we finish the two months of praying, we, we issue a brand new cover. So you want to receive it. It's free. We, don't, we don't charge you for this. We'd like for you to pray for us. And um, you can just um, sign up for it. On that brochure, just say prayer band guide, prayer band guide. And you can, re you can request it as a booklet or as an email, either way. We'd be happy to send those to you if you're willing to be a regular prayer warrior for the ministry. So these are the different ways you can continue in your participation. Okay, we'll open the floor for questions. And again, you can ask any question you would like. But the only question I won't answer is the topics I'm going to cover tomorrow morning. Outside of that, there are no limitations. You don't have to limit your questions to what we've covered. You can ask some other questions as long as it doesn't touch tomorrow's subjects.